Welcome back to the Biotechnology series. Today we are going to talk about ligand evolution with a focus on protein ligands. The ligand generally refers to a molecule that can bind to a specific target. They can be organic or inorganic and can range in size and complexity from simple water molecules or small organic molecules to large proteins or even DNA strands. And the binding between a target and a ligand can have significant effects on the chemical and physical properties of the resulting coordination of the complex. We will look at the concept of directed evolution of ligands with a specific focus on how this methodology was revolutionary in the way that it helped generate new enzymes and antibodies. We have previously talked about using hybrid DOMA technology to produce large quantities of monoclonal antibodies. Now, in brief, hybrid DOMA technology involves first injecting an antigen into a mouse. After the mouse mounted an immune response, antibody producing B cells were collected and fused with immortal cancer cells that can divide indefinitely in cell culture. Now, the resulting fused cells are called hybrid domas, have the ability to produce large quantities of a single type of antibodies, meaning monoclonal antibodies. Now, the basis for these antibodies rely on the animal's adaptive immune response, so the antibody's affinity and specificity depend on the B cell diversity and the three mechanisms behind the B cell diversity, namely somatic recombination, junctional diversity, and somatic hypermutations. The B cell development is also subjected to positive and negative selections through both central and peripheral mechanisms. Now, although hybridoma technology is very mature and reliable, but it requires to using animals that may be more prone to batch-to-batch -batch variation of the final product. So the question is, can we get antibodies without using animals? The answer is certainly a big yes, and let's look at how. Before we look at how to generate antibodies, we need to understand the concept of a ligand evolution and selection because antibodies are an example of a ligand. Now, the field of direct evolutions of enzymes has been awarded the 2018 Nobel Prize for Chemistry, and Dr. Francis Arno is credited for the advancement of this field. Now, I was fortunate that I was able to listen to Dr. Arno before she got the, her Nobel Prize in 2015 uh, at Denver, Colorado, uh, during a American Chemical Society conference. Almost all of us have heard of the term evolution at the organism level, and more precisely, evolution by natural selection, which happens at a very slow pace. Now, the idea of evolution to improve the fitness of an organism to tackle the changing environment is not new. And actually, humans have long been practicing directed evolution in the forms of selective breeding. Now, farmers and breeders do selective breeding on livestock and companion animals for more favorable uh, features. The plants and crops are also selectively crossbred to gain more agricultural value. Now, from old paintings, we can see Watermelons from 1645 contained very little flesh, but watermelons in today's world are full of delicious red flesh. Now, these changes in the organisms are a result of human-directed evolution, and it has created these changes in a fraction of time compared to natural evolution. Now, most importantly, the result of directed evolution is what the population desires. Desires. Now we see the appearance of an organism changed as the result of direct evolution or we call it changes in phenotype. But what really has changed at the cellular level 
It is all about proteins and enzymes that are expressed within each cell. And directed evolution of enzymes and proteins is performed in laboratory, and scientists use this process to speed up the change of enzymes and proteins to achieve a specific goal. Now, during this process, the protein sequence of a given enzymes and proteins are designed to have both well-defined fixed regions and as well as intended variations of randomness to create different variations that may have the desired functionality. Now, the different versions of protein and enzymes are subjugated to engineered screening and selection strategy, and this engineered selection process is iterative, during which proteins with undesired performance are discarded, and the rest are directed to a specific goal. Ultimately, produce a functional protein with a satisfactory performance level that can bind to the substrate or target very tightly with high affinity and very specific with high specificity. Directed enzyme evolution is used to improve the efficiency and selectivity of enzymes and used as environmentally friendly alternatives to metals and organic catalysts in industrial processes such as the productions of pharmaceuticals, chemicals, and biofuels. The directed enzyme and human antibodies evolutions is used to develop leads that can be used as therapeutics. Let's look at the practice in a nutshell. The directed evolution libraries are designed to contain a large number of genetic variations of a target enzyme or protein, which can then be screened for improved properties using a selection or screening process. There are several different methods for designing directed evolution libraries depending on the specific goals and constraints of the project. Some common approaches include random mutant genesis. This approach involves introducing random mutations into the gene encoding the target protein, typically using mutagenic antigens such as UV radiation, chemical mutagens, or error-prone PCR or polymerase chain reaction. A site-directed mutagenesis is uh, involved in introducing targeted mutation into specific regions of the gene encoding that protein, typically using PCR-based techniques or other methods for precise genome editing. The goal is to create a library containing a large number of variants with diverse sequences and properties. Although directed evolution does not involve using live animals, but most of the time, single-cell organisms are still used to produce the enzymes with mutations. Bacteria, bacteriophage, and yeast are commonly used for display the protein generated from the random library. But this process can also be cell-free, such as using water in oil emulsion droplets containing ribosomes and library messenger RNA. Screening or selection process begin with the library, and the li when the library is screened or selected for variants with improved properties using a specific assays or selection process. For example, the library may be screened for variants with increased activity, stability, or specificity using a high-throughput assay or selection system. But the selection step must be adopted for each enzyme and may be coupled to a cellular survival function if cells are used in the process. The isolations and characterization is followed. The best performing variants are isolated from the library and characterized using additional assays and experiments to confirm their improved properties and determine the specific mutations responsible for the improvements. The selection process is an iterative process, 
and the isolated variants are used as the starting point for the next round of direct evolution, with additional mutations introduced into the genetic library, and the screening or the selection process repeated to improve the enzyme's properties further. But the goal here is to continue the selection cycle until the desired reaction outcome reaches a plateau or at maximum efficiency. Here is a way to look at the outcome of a direct enzyme evolution process. A here is a scenario where the enzyme with no activity for the intended reaction, and this enzyme would not be ideal for evolution since no sequence variations will create a new reactivity. Now in scenario B, which is a little bit different, it is a promiscuous enzyme with at least some low activity for the intended reaction, which is a good starting point, and the variants of the enzyme can have boosted up new reactivity within only a small number of selection cycles. The 2018 Nobel Prize for Chemistry is shared with two other scientists who were credited for their involvement in phage display of peptide and antibodies. Phage display is a technique that is often used to carry directed evolution for peptides and antibodies. Now in phage display, a library of proteins, typically peptides or antibody or antibody fragments, is genetically encoded into the genome of a bacterial phage, and the library is then expressed on the surface of the phage particles, allowing for the selection of specific peptides or antibodies from the library. The selection process is very similar to the direct evolutions of enzyme, with the exception that during the enrichment process, the isolated phage particles are used to infect a new culture of bacteria, which leads to the production of a new library of phage particles with the selected mutations. Uh, this process is repeated multiple times to enrich the desired mutations. Here is a simple looking of the breakdown of the process. First, it begins with the generation of a library. Now, this library of peptide or antibody fragment is created by introducing random mutations into the gene coding of the protein. Now, this can be done again with a variety of methods such as error-prone PCR or DNA shuffling. Now, during the selection process, the library is then exposed to a target molecule, for example, a protein of interest, and non-binding phage particles are washed away. The phage particles that bind to the target molecules are then isolated and amplified. Now, during the enrichment stage, the isolated uh, phage particles are used to infect a new culture of bacteria, which leads to productions of a new library of phage particles with the selected mutation. This process is repeated multiple times to enrich for the desired mutations. The whole selection process is similar to classical affinity purification, in which individuals in the library with the highest affinity for a target are captured on solid support. Now, multiple and extensive washing steps were performed before the best binding peptides, which connected to the phage, are eluded with acid. Now, typically, the separation process is done with a simple panning experiment or fluorescent activated cell sorting or FAS. The theoretical diversity of a phage displayed protein library is determined by the number of unique variants that can be generated through the introduction of random mutations in the DNA sequence encoding the protein. Now, the actual diversity of a library depends on the size of the library and the fidelity of the mutagenesis process. The displayed peptides are typically between 8 to 20 amino acids in length, and for example, if a library of a peptide or antibody fragments is created using random mutagenesis, 
the theoretical diversity can be calculated as 20 to the nth, where 20 represents the 20 different amino acids, and n is the number of amino acids in the protein sequence. Now, therefore, a 7-mer peptide library would have a theoretical diversity of approximately 20 to the 12th, or approximately 4.3 times 10 to the 7th. Now, however, the actual diversity of a library may be lower due to the limitations in mutagenesis process, such as incomplete coverage of all possible mutations or the introduction of bias in mutation pattern. Additionally, not all of the sequences in the library may be properly folded or displayed on the phage surface, it further reducing the effective diversity of the library. Typically, phage displayed protein libraries are designed to have a diversity of at least 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8th variants, which is sufficient to cover a significant portion of the sequence space for most protein families. Phage display has been used extensively for the discovery and development of therapeutic antibodies. For example, the antibody adalimumab, or brand name Humira, which is used to treat rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases, was discovered using phage display and was first approved in 2002 by the US FDA. Adalimumab can bind to TNF-alpha with very high affinity and blocks its immunological action. In addition to phage display, there are several cellular and cell-free display technologies that have been developed for the generation and screening of large protein libraries with specific binding properties. Here are a few examples. In bacterial display, a library of proteins is expressed on the surface of bacterial cells, typically using outer membrane proteins or pili and the proteins can be screened for binding to target molecules by fluorescent activated cell sorting or magnetic activated cell sorting. In ribosome display, a display of proteins is generated by in vitro transcription and translation in the presence of ribosomes, which allows the protein to be expressed and displayed on the ribosome surface. And in mRNA display, a library of proteins is generated by in vitro transcription and translation in the presence of puromycin conjugated DNA template, which allows the proteins to be conveniently attached to the messenger RNA. And in cell-free display, a library of proteins is generated by in vitro transcription and translation using a cell-free protein synthesis system. Now, overall, these protein display technologies offer alternative ways to generate and screen protein libraries for specific binding properties. Here is a part of my past, and during my early years of PhD study, I worked with a yeast display library to display a single-chain variable fragment of an antibody. A single-chain variable fragment, SCFV, is a type of antibody fragment that consists of the variable regions of the heavy and light chains of an antibody linked together by a short peptide linker. And in yeast display, a library of protein is expressed on the surface of yeast cells using fusions to uh, Agar2P or Agar1P proteins. And the proteins can be screened for binding to a target molecules using fast or magnetic separation. Now, I was involved in screening for SFV specific for a type of invasive prostate cancer and tried to develop a SCFV drug conjugate. In conclusion, there are many ways to screen for functional proteins such as enzymes and antibodies without the need to use animals. Now, these screening techniques can generate human or humanized proteins as the end product 
with low to no immunogenicity for generating anti-drug antibodies. Now, the basic screening uh, project is fairly straightforward and can be performed in academic labs with the right equipment and funding. So we have just looked at the technology for the directed evolutions of proteins. Next week will be the last episode of the biotechnology series, perhaps season one. You never know. Now we will look at the direct evolution of nuclear acids with a nuclear acid library. That's my PhD dissertation work and also my work with my current students and past students as well. Now we'll look at how this work and my academic pedigree are remotely connected to a Nobel Prize laureate, Jack Sostak, Dr. Jack Sostak. So stay tuned for the last episode of the biotechnology series titled The Past, Present, and Future of Aptomer. Take care. See you next time. Bye.